Thank you. Prof, uh, I have a question. Okay, but we have a question in Durham, and I'm going to address that first, okay? Then we'll come to your question. The question was the following. If we assume this alpha is alpha bar, for kinetic energy and yes. uh, since we're trying to model in divergence as a special case of uh, the uh, dynamic phenomenon and since uh, divergence is a static phenomenon I was thinking in statics we normally use uh, second moment of area when you try to uh, second moment of area in the expression EI but when you come to uh, which is the resistance to bending actually and when you come to rotational uh, motions then we use inertia i which is the mass moment of inertia i was thinking why we're using mass moment of inertia for a bending phenomenon like divergence okay well, first of all uh, divergence is not primarily a bending phenomenon it's primarily a rotational torsional pitching in fact you know that we deliberately left out the possibility that there could be a translation of this flat flat. And I'm going to put that in this morning, so just to reassure you on that point. What we will discover is when we allow for translation, the translation will not change the divergence. 
Okay. You don't know that yet necessarily unless you've read the book. But uh, we'll show that this morning. That's one thing that we'll do. Uh, with respect to the mass moment of inertia, I alpha, the reason I decided to home with all the following divergence is a static phenomenon. Therefore, we can leave out kinetic energy to assess divergence. We can do that. In fact, that's how it's traditionally done. But the reason for including the dynamics in the problem, including kinetic energy, including the mass inertia and transfer, is to show you that if you do a dynamic analysis, the static phenomenon is, uh, will come out of that analysis as well. The way it works is the following. If you're not sure whether the instability is static or dynamic, you better do a dynamic analysis because it might be dynamic. On the other hand, if it turns out to be static, not great. But the dynamic analysis will still tell you all you need to know. You will have done more work, strictly speaking, than you had to do, but you have the assurance that you think it will look something like a dynamic instability. Also, also, this is education. Give you greater insight into the static phenomenon by coming at it from a dynamic perspective. Does that help? Uh, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, in in the video of the divergence, uh, the plate seems to flutter. So I thought that divergence is an instability in which the wing just bends and stays in that configuration. But in that video, the wing starts to flutter, which is a dynamic instability. That's why I didn't understand what's going on. If it flutters, it flutters. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. You look at the video. Those videos, for the most part, are videos of flutter instabilities, which are dynamic instabilities. Uh, which is the build of the which accepts divergence. In fact, the videos. Uh, that you see are largely flutter. And the reason for that is, is it's, you know, it's entertaining. It's education, but it's also entertainment. Seeing something statically diverged is kind of boring compared to seeing something under flutter. So, uh, 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 oh, did you see them that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Looks like the, uh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were, I was referring to some of the videos. Apparently the one you're thinking about is the inverted flag. Oh, divergence movie. And you sent that through that we said? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, everything I said was true, but it was irrelevant. Uh, the uh, movie that Danny Levin sent you recently was of divergence, but apparently in that particular configuration, it diverged so much that the uh, Structure hit the wind tunnel wall, and when it hits the wind tunnel wall, that introduces a nonlinear impact, and so it bounces against the wall and it looks like it's oscillating. But if we had more carefully controlled our our uh, speed so that we diverged but didn't diverge to such a large deflection, it would have just been a static deformation. Okay, that okay. Yeah, yeah, that helps a lot. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. I was thinking of a different video. Other questions? Here we know. Okay, let me continue. Uh, excuse me, uh, Professor, sorry to interrupt you, but um, we hardly hear. I mean, there's a background noise when you speak. Yeah, it starts when you speak. Uh, what? So I think it has to do with your mic or something. Okay, well, I'll try to stay closer to the mic. That's the background Okay. I don't hear any background noise. Hello? Hello? Is that better? We're trying to do something. Do something. Yeah, it's better. Okay. All right. So let me keep going. Uh, let's go back to our flat plate with the torsion spring. A alpha. Okay. And now, just to make life more interesting, let's add another spring, which is a linear spring, and that's well, the case of H. 
and now we're going to allow this system to move in translation up and down, but also rotate as before. Okay. Now we can again write down potential energy. Now there are two potential, two, two contributions to potential energy. One we had before, plus another one due to the translation in H and the spring constant K. Okay. And with respect to kinetic energy, we have one half I alpha alpha dot squared as before, plus one half the total mass of this system. I'll call it capital M times H dot squared. Okay? And then we have virtual work which is the moment we had before, times the virtual change in, sorry about that, times the virtual change in alpha, plus the total aerodynamic force, it's called lift, that's what aerodynamics is for, times del H. And let me remind you that in our simple aerodynamic model, where Alpha is L times the distance E, which is the distance from here to where the lift acts. And then the lift is Q, the dynamic pressure, times C times 2 pi times alpha. Or it could be alpha plus alpha naught, but for my purposes, I'm not going to bother it at the moment. It's good alpha naught. Just the simple alpha. But I could add it up. The key is, in this aerodynamic model, lift doesn't depend on H. Okay? So if you use all that information and use Lagrange's equations, and now they're two, one for H, one for alpha, you'll get two different Well, those two different equations be a few pages of algebra later. They will be I alpha, alpha double dot, plus A alpha, uh, alpha. Uh, excuse me. Um, Previous equations, please. Previous equations, please. Thank you very much. Uh, give, 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 give me more volume so I can hear them. Yeah. Uh, what about now? Okay, how are we doing now? Stockholm? Perfect, perfect. This is the most thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, well, let's continue on. Uh, let me go back a, a, a page just to see if our friends in Stockholm can, can uh, hear me. Uh, and again, you remember these notes are going to be available to you after class. So now we're going to allow for translation of this as well as rotation about this point, right? So both springs are connected to the same point. Obviously, you could generalize this and have them connected two different points if you want to, but this is enough for our uh, purposes. Okay, so now the, the potential energy has two contributions, one from rotation and one from translation, and so does the kinetic energy. By the way, implicit in what I've written down is that, is that the center of mass is also at this spring point. If that were not true, then we'd have to generalize this a bit. But again, for our purposes, it doesn't matter. Uh, at least not this morning. Uh, then the virtual work is the moment acting through a virtual rotation plus the force, the lift force, acting through a virtual translation. And then the aerodynamic model we've been using, which we will someday improve, but this is one we're using this morning, is given by this, and I was highlighting the fact that the lift and also the moment only depend on alpha. They do not depend on H in this model. Later models will have an H dependence as well, but in this model, that's not true. So then you use Lagrange's equations.
and you get this. Ah, I'm going to change something in a moment, but that's okay. Well, you would get this. Okay, that's what you get from Lagrange's equation. But just to make air elasticity as complicated as possible for those who do not deal with it every day, the tradition, the tradition in air elasticity is to define H, which is the translation up and down to this point, as positive down, and the lift is positive up. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's what most of the literature is all about, right? Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Which means that rather than this being a plus sign, it's really a minus sign, right? Because if H and alpha, H and L are in opposite directions, you have to take that into account when you compute work. Because work is a force acting in the same direction as the as the displacement. So over here you also get a minus sign. Doesn't matter. Okay. So I'm sorry. Is there an H inching after the KH um, second equation? This one? Yeah. What about it? Is there an H missing? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, was, yes, thank you. Yes. Got excited. Yes, there is an H missing. Okay. But think about this. M sub alpha is L times E. And L, we can write it down. L only depends on alpha. So I can solve this equation for alpha first without worrying about H. And then once I have alpha, I can put, plug it in here and solve for H. So the alpha motion doesn't depend on the H motion, OK? And therefore, it turns out you can't get diverge. You can't get divergence from, from bending only in this simple model because it's really the homogeneous part, if you will, without now known that determines stability. Now, there, there are more complicated models. In particular, if I have a wing, and we're going to talk about wings later on. In fact, we're going to talk about it next. If I have a wing and I sweep it back, right, a swept wing, then the H and alpha motions are coupled even in divergence, even in statics, as well as dynamic. So swept wings can undergo a form of divergence plus H and alpha. So anyway, this is why we didn't put put the H motion in your homework, because we really didn't need it, aside from the fact that this would make the algebra a little more complicated. OK? Now, what we want to do next is to go to a yet more elaborate model, but not the ultimate. We're not ready for the ultimate, but we're making progress. Now we're going to look at the following. We're going to look at a something that almost looks like a wing. This is a, a wing, if you will. We'll call this the y-axis. We have air going this way. And this is a top view. And we want to analyze this for divergence as well, ultimately also for flutter, but we're still in statics and divergence territory. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to write down potential energy. We're going to write down kinetic energy if you want to do a dynamic analysis. You don't want to do a dynamic analysis? All right, maybe then we just forget about uh, kinetic energy. And then we'll need to use a aerodynamic model. Uh, so what we're going to do in, in this case is we're going to have a more elaborate structural model uh, since the statics, I'm going to ignore the inertia. Well, we can assign that as a homework problem, right? And then uh, we'll also use the same aerodynamic model that we used before. Okay. Is that kosher? Is that okay to use a better structural theory and a same old, same old aerodynamic theory? Well, yeah, it's done all the time. Also, there are other people who are more aerodynamically minded who will use more elaborate aerodynamic theories and simple structural model. And those people write papers. When you're at Boeing, you want to make sure that the two are compatible. That there's no point in using a very elaborate aerodynamic theory and a simple structural model and vice versa. You want you want to have, have both models at roughly the same level. Now it's apples and oranges. 
So you have to decide a balance of, of, of a fruit salad, right? Because we're talking about two different things. So you have to understand both sides of, of the issue, both the aerodynamic side and the structural side, to make sure you're not spending a lot of time uh, with a very sophisticated structural theory, which is totally uh, superfluous because the aerodynamic theory isn't worth a really elaborate structural theory, or vice versa. But we'll get to that later. Okay, so what's the kinetic energy? I'm glad you asked. We just decided that we don't need to think about translation. The counterpart of that in this case is this wing really does two things. This axis, remember this is the top view, it bends up and down in and out of the paper, the plane of the paper. It also twists about this axis, but we're just going to allow for the twist. Okay? And the twist potential energy is one half. See, it's always one half. That part you can only get. But now it's a distributed twist, and it's a distributed potential energy, which depends on what. As, and if this dimension is L, okay, it's, L is the span of the wing, to use aerospace terminology, it's integral from zero to L over Y of GJ, which could depend on Y, by the way, d alpha dy. So remember, alpha now is a function of y, which we hope to determine at some point. And g, gj might depend on y, too. And it turns out uh, we'll do two things. Probably as a homework problem, we'll allow you to do the case where gj is a constant, but maybe not. Well, maybe that'll be first part. And the second part, we can allow you to do the case where gj is not or something like that. Anyway. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and then we need to write down our, our uh, uh, virtual work. And now it's it's the moment again, but the moment might also depend on y. And so, oops, del alpha. We want to make sure it's del alpha, right? D1. Okay. And the moment is L times E. E might depend on Y also. And L, thank you, is uh, Q, C, if it's low speed flow, 2 pi times alpha. And again, alpha depends on Y, and so will the lift, and therefore so will the moment, right? And by the way, C could also the chord. I mean, I, I've drawn a picture where the chord is constant, right? This is the chord. But I could have a wing where it tapers in some way, and C could depend on Y, too. Okay. For the MA, it has the same uh, unit with the previous MA, but with this uh, integral, it also integrates yeah, the length. Yeah. Well, someone asked me a question, I think it was Kevin, about this in the homework. I, I cheated a little bit in your homework, uh, in that if you really looked at the homework, this K alpha, let's, let's go back to K alpha to answer your question. The question is, what about units? If you look at the, well, let's look at this expression first. This, this is supposed to be a force, right? Q has what dimensions? Pressure. C has dimensions of length. Mm -hmm. So this pressure times length, all these other things are non-dimensional. So pressure times length does not have the units of force. All right? So this force is really force per unit span. And therefore, I have to integrate, over, and therefore, this is the moment per unit span. And therefore, I have to integrate over the entire span to get the total moment effect, right? So in this case, the moment the units actually work out very nicely. And the previous case in the homework, other than Kevin, no one was bothered by this, but he's he's very particular. He's very <laughs> very fussy. And so he asked me a question. I had to confess that K alpha really had to be stiffness per unit span and phi, right? I'm, when I draw draw that rigid plate, I'm really thinking of that as per unit span. I'm really thinking of this case without the clamping, and then I put a spring, right? And there, there's an applied span 
which you didn't see because I didn't draw the picture that way. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, now, <clears throat> with this information, what can we do? Well, we can do lots of things. We could derive a differential equation that governs alpha. How would we do that? Well, you could do it by divine insight. You could look it up in a reference, or as I would prefer you do, you would use Hamblin's principle. Except as we know, Hamblin's principle for statics reduces to the principle of virtual work. Remember how we simplified Hamblin's principle for statics? So you could use that. If you do that, I don't mind, but I should have signed it. No, I won't sign it. If you do that, <clears throat> The differential equation will be, let's see, I have to remember now, how does this come out? Two, 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 two. Yes, subject to a minus sign, but I think I got this right. The difference equation will be partial, respect, uh, well, or total, since it only depends on one, of gj, partial of alpha with respect to y, plus m sub y equals zero, or oh, oh, m sub alpha. Sometimes people say m sub y, but I'm going to put m sub alpha. I think that's a more uh, uh, effective notation. Let's see. Let me think about it. I have to do this in my head. Uh, minus. Don't give me a plus. Yeah, I think this is right. But you, it's in the book. Okay. And then M sub alpha is L times E, which is what? It's Q C E 2 pi times alpha. All right. So let me write this down one more time. QCE 2 pi alpha equals zero. And again, we should check the units. It's always a good idea to check the units. Kevin always checks the units. But some of you may not have gotten in that good habit yet, but we should always check the units. First of all, let me tell you what G is. G is the shear modulus of the material. It's a material property. And it's equal to uh, E, which is the tensile modulus, uh, divided by, I think, 2 times 1 plus nu. Hey, you can look this up in strength material. I think that's what it is. J is a property of the geometry of the cross-section. And uh, if we have a nice plate-like material, a plate-like wing of a certain thickness, which I'll call H, not to be confused ever with translational displacement, uh, it's equal to one third h cubed times c, where here h has a different meaning than in our previous. This is the thickness of the wing. And of course, c is the core of the wing. So this has the dimensions of length to the fourth, right? G and E have the, what dimensions? What are, what are the dimensions of E and G? Uh, pressure. Pressure or stress, right? It's force per length squared. And then I have a second derivative. I have two d do y. So that gives me a one over length squared. So if you work that out, uh, this has the dimensions of force, I hope. Because this term has what dimensions? Force. Force. Force, because it's pressure times length squared. So even though this is basically a moment or torsional-like equation involving moments, the units of all these terms are really force. And why is that? Because it's really moment per unit span, <laughs> which is force times length over length, and length cancel out. So more intuitively, you might think of this as a, an equation in moments per unit span, but that happens to have the same dimensions as force, right? Okay. All right. 
So what do I do with that equation? What can I do with this equation? Oops. Thank you. Well, I could find the divergence, Q. But I don't quite have enough information yet to do that. What do I need? Characteristic equation or something like that. Yeah, well, I, I need the boundary condition. This is a difference equation. I'm, it's a second order difference equation in a spatial variable. So I need two boundary conditions, one at each end of the wing. Well, at this end of the wing, I certainly know what it is. Alpha is zero, right? And it's held there, and alpha cannot. What about at this end? Oh, the moment is zero. What moment? Yes, that's right, but what moment? The internal one. Yeah. What yeah. 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 <laughs> the good news is, Hamilton's principle, see, will give you two things. It will give you this different equation, which I just gave you. But it will also give you the boundary conditions. Uh -huh. That's another reason why you should want to know Hamilton's principle. There's a famous case, well, several famous cases, or infamous things in the literature where people by using Newton's second law, which you could also do, you can use Newton's second law to get this equation. I wouldn't advise it, but you could. But Newton's second law will never tear the boundary conditions without some other physically intuitive idea. Whereas Hamblin's principle, you write down the energies and you work it out, go through the usual uh, steps of Hamblin's principle to derive the difference equation, will give you the boundary conditions at no extra cost. Well, that's not quite, I mean, you have to do a little more. But, but Basically, you get the boundary conditions as well as the differential equation, which is really important. Okay, I'll tell you what the boundary conditions are if this end and this end are both fixed, which is not the way usually things are modeled, but if they were both fixed, I'd have alpha zero, alpha equals zero here, and alpha equals zero here. And if I did that and put that as the end, I use those boundary conditions, construct an eigenvalue problem, and uh, apply those boundary conditions and determine the divergence dynamic pressure. So your, your assignment is to do that. And also to do the case where one end is clamped, the other end is free, and use Hamblin's principle to derive the correct boundary condition for that case. Now, the question is, of those two cases, one where it's fixed at both ends and one where it's fixed at one end and the other three, which one will have higher divergence dynamic pressure? The clamp clamp. Which one? Clamp clamp. Clamp clamp. Stepper. Stepper. No, three of the three of the I get it. And you can, you can tell that experimentally by putting a load, a moment on it and seeing how much it twists. If you clamp it at both ends, it'll to twist left, right? One end of three is one. Okay. Uh, now. Father question. Uh, before you get to the one thing, let's do the case alpha of one equals zero equals zero. I'm going to give you a head start on this case. Alpha of i equals L equals zero. So fixed at both angles. Fixed at both angles. Okay. Yes, you had a fix on that. What's your question? Yeah. I would like to know if d uh, alpha uh, d alpha by d y is also bound to condition at the clamp end. Yeah, well, that's true. You got the answer. Did you derive that by the sides by in a book or by Hamilton's principle? By Hamilton's. Okay, good. Well, you're ahead on the hook. Okay. You. Okay. So uh, he revealed the answer. So I might as well tell you the case. Okay, clamp three. Uh -huh. or, or fix uh -huh. three. But I still like you to use uh, Hamilton's principle to do it. So fix three is still uh, alpha is still zero at y equals zero. But as was pointed out, it's d alpha d y and y equals l if it's free. And if you uh, go into a book on structural mechanics, 
you'll discover that the elastic moment, the elastic moment at the end is not just this, but gj times this. But assume that gj is not zero at the end. It's something, right? Because the chord is something that still has a certain thickness. You know, right? Therefore, the alpha dy is zero. Okay, so how would you solve this differential equation? And let me do this case. Um, I'll let you do that case. What form of the solution are we going to assume? Let me ask my colleague here in Durham, who, who I, I, I know is, is uh, very interested in solutions of different equations. So what form will, will I assume for alpha of y mm. to make some further progress? Well, I assume there's going to be an exponential in there. Ah, very good. So I'll give you an exponential. What else? I think that exponential is just going to be power of lambda t. Well, almost, but not also, twice. There's also a unique speed. What, what does alpha depend on? It, oh, sorry, y. Y, 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 y. And why not alpha bar again, right? That was good enough before, it's still good. From a mathematical perspective, it's the same thing. It's a linear difference equation. The one we had before was a function of time. This one's a function of y, but we, we played the same game and used the same one. And it will turn out, because this is a second order equation in alpha, how many, how many lambdas will there be? You tell me the order of the difference equation, I'll tell you how many lambdas there are. Uh, of course, if the order goes up, then there are more lambdas and they're harder to compute. Second order is pretty easy, and that's why we often do second order equations. Okay, so uh, let's call this equation one. And call this equation two. We're going to put equation two into equation one and see what happens. Um, now, equation one It's actually a fairly challenging equation to solve, even though it's linear. It is linear, by the way, right? It's linear. Why? Because if gj happens to depend on y, the coefficients of this different equation are not constant. And so unless gj happens to have some special dependence, so this turns out to be Bessel's equation or something, someone has spent a lot of time and energy working out the form of Bessel's functions, but in general, it'll be hard to solve. So usually the first thing we do is solve the problem for gj, a constant, also for c and e, a constant. Remember, in general, they might depend on y, right? I mean, they might vary along the span. And, but why we do that? Well, it's easier. And it'll give us some insight to what's going on. And if if I were doing if I only knew how to do the constant coefficient case, and the wing I had really wasn't constant coefficient, then what would we do? Well, the simplest thing to do would be to take some average value along the span of gj. And the I mean, in fact, what elasticians do? There's a magic span location that most elasticians like. What what location is that? In the middle. Well, it could be in the middle. I think. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. Mostly the three quarters point, right? Three quarters. Yeah. Maybe in Israel they do half half span. In, in the United States they do three quarters. I like them. Anyway, yeah, right. But you you could you know you, you assume some value that's sort of in the middle of what value you have, or you can do something better. And let me tell you what. First of all, I'm going to let you do this part, right? Uh, that, I mean, you know how to solve a different question. And I'm going to let you do this case for G J equals a constant. But now I'm going to go on and talk about what do you do when gj isn't a constant. Okay. I mean, if you want to be a little more precise, you do the following. Um, you take alpha of y, and you write it as alpha bar, which is constant. Right? It's, not, it's constant in the sense that it doesn't depend on y times function 
What function do I use? Well, again, I could use the bind inside. Or I could use the function that I determined by solving the special case of gj is a constant. Right? If it's good enough for gj is a constant, maybe it's a pretty good approximation for the case when gj and c and e are not constants. That's the, that's the, and it turns out it is. In fact, you can generalize this. You can write this as a summation over n for one, two, three, or however many you like of alpha sub n times psi n of y, where you have a series of functions, right? And where do these functions come? Well, it turns out when you solve the constant gj problem, it turns out you, you get more perhaps than you thought you would. You'll get a lot of size, not just one. Now, it turns out of all the size you'll get, one of them is most critical in the sense that corresponding to each psi, there is a divergence dynamic pressure. Strictly speaking, there are an infinity of them. But it's like golf. The lowest score wins. The lowest dynamic pressure at which divergence occurs is the one that's physically significant. Because when I put this model in a wind tunnel, once I hit divergence, you know, the, the structure hits the ball or it does something untoward. And I don't care what happens at the larger dynamic pressure. In fact, the whole model breaks down because once I have divergence, the, the deformations are large, and I'm beyond the range of any linear model. I mean, I've exceeded the uh, capacity of the linear model to tell me anything. But these functions are still useful because all the higher order ones are still useful because I can sum those up to solve the problem when gj is not a constant and determine the lowest dynamic pressure which divergence occurs for that case. Okay. Are each of the alpha n's a constant? They're, they, they're, they, they don't depend on one. Yeah, so they're alpha. So they're, <laughs> they're alpha. But usually the notation is But yeah, you want to put a bar up. I need you. Professor, I have a yeah. question. Yeah, these uh, psi ends, they are basically, they basically come from uh, the boundary conditions, right? Yes. Yeah, so I was reading the book and I saw something like this. So is it like for, for this particular case, uh, let's say it's clamped at both ends, so it may look like a sine function and all the multiples of sine? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I'm really doing the homework problem, of course. I'll tell you what. The fixed, fixed case. Fixed, fixed case. The size of n's are sine n pi pi over l. Right? Yeah. Because these functions are zero at y zero and y equals l, right? For all that is for the fixed case. It will be cosine functions we could. Sine 2n minus 1 oh, okay. i y over l. That's also yeah. at y equals 0, right? Remember, the yeah, 3n is not the size that are 0, it's the derivative. The derivative area. It's 0. If you differentiate this, You'll get a cosine and a cosine of a of an odd power of pi y over over l gives you zero. Right? But notice that the, this for the fixed three case, these psi functions are maximum at the at the tip, right? As you might expect, it's free in. That's where the maximum twist occurs. Okay. So that's the case. Now, in other cases, more elaborate cases. Uh, you'll find that often these functions are determined numerically. In fact, uh, in the real world, usually there's a group over here that knows something about finite element codes, and you tell them, I need some functions, run your finite element code, give me the functions I need to do my 
Harold Atkin analogies. And they do that. Harold asked this in or and we don't want to waste our time doing something that <laughs> lesser more than this. Right? Sometimes they are less. Right? It's a small. But a Boeing separate group, right? Like that. You wouldn't have the airline system group doing that. Anyway, okay, so that's that's it. Now, <laughs> do what we had before. And let's be static, which means that Hamilton's principle. Reduces to what? Minus del u plus del w equals zero, right? This is the part to do the aerodynamics. And uh, I'm not going to do all of this because that would take too much time, and I just want to show you what you, what you do. Remember, u is now, oops, sorry, yep, u is one half integral from zero to l of gj. D alpha dy dy. Okay. So what am I going to do now? Uh, this is equation three. I'll call this four. So should that okay. be d alpha dy squared? Say it again. Should that be d alpha? I'm sorry. Thank no. you. Did, did I leave off the squared before? Uh, yes. Yeah. Did I? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. You get just too polite. Or you you're just now picking up on that. I didn't find it. <laughs> sorry about that. It's squared, right? Yeah, that's pretty important. I think I would probably discover it when I put in the next step. But okay, so this would be squared. Uh, so now I'm going to put equation three into equation four and see what I get. And I have gj, I have a summation over n of alpha n, I have d psi n dy, uh, that's this, and then it all gets squared dy, all right? That's a long y, a y with a long tail. Now, if you haven't done this before, uh, well, we have to be a little careful. Is that right, Kevin? When we, we square that series? Yeah. Why is that? You have multiple nodes. Yeah. Here, we, we, we have a series and we're squaring it. So there are terms like, you know, the cross products. And so the, to avoid getting confused, Maybe you wouldn't get confused, but I would. Most other people. You really want to write this in a different way. You really want to write it as follows. You want to write it as one half the integral from zero to l of g j, the sum over n of alpha n d psi n d y. And remember, we're summing over n, so n takes on all values. So we want to write that and multiply it by another sum, right? But to avoid confusion, I want to sum over a different index. So I want to sum over m. So I really have a double sum. A double sum. Because I'm squaring a, a single sum. And if I cube this single sum, I would get a triple sum. So on. Okay. But the good news is, if I take that, I can write it in the very following compact way. It's one half uh, the alphas don't depend on y. So I can take the alphas outside the integral over y, right? And I can also take the summations outside. So I have double sum over m and n of alpha m times alpha n 
and I'm going to use the Fallman symbol to indicate what's left, where this K sub M N is defined as the integral over GJ of partial psi sub N with respect to Y, partial psi sub M with respect to Y dy. Right? And, and I'm just using this, this definition to simplify my notation. So what, what I have to do now is you tell me what gj is. I have, by some means, determined these magic functions. Oh, sorry. Change my notation to midstream on you. Didn't mean to do that. These are, let me write this again. K sub mn. Zero to L, GJ partial size of N respect to Y partial size of M with respect to Y D1. Right? So I have these magic functions. I have GJ. I can work out these intervals. I may have to do them numerically, but that's not a big deal, right? Um, now this looks a lot like the old spring case, right? Mathematically, it is. Just like the old spring case, except now I have I have an expression for the spring constant, which is a more sophisticated representation of the structure because it takes into account the torsional distance, torsional stiffness distribution along its plane and so forth. But from a mathematical point of view, I'm really right back to where I started. And if I only use one term in this summation, I only have one alpha, and you can look at that equation I get out of this, and it'll look exactly like the spring case we did before, where the effective spring constant k sub alpha is now known in terms of gj and all these other wonderful things. So when, I, when you finally get down to the one-term representation, it's mathematically the same question you had before. Okay. Therefore, you don't really have to solve it again. You just have to identify the new equivalent case of alpha. Uh, isn't that good? That's very good. Okay. I've been talking too much this morning. Are there questions? Okay. Any questions in Stockholm? Uh, professor? Yes. Yes. Uh, I was reading about the, the uh, aerodynamic center, and I came across one article where it was written that the aerodynamic center, it actually depends on, it's basically the moment has to be zero along that point. So along in, uh, in, in, the, in the clockwise direction, there is no point, no such point where the moment is zero, uh, which is, let, let we say that it's at uh, three fourths of the quad, right? But it says like there is no single point, it varies with the uh, flow speed. Because it depends on the pressure distribution. So why do we assume that it's at the quad, uh, like quarter quad? Okay. Well, you asked several questions. First of all, there is what's called the aerodynamic center. The aerodynamic center is the point about which the moment, the aerodynamic moment, is not of the angle of attack, which in our model is alpha. So if you when I write down M sub alpha, and then I say L sub E, right? And, uh, oh, thank you. And then the L itself depends on, uh, right? I didn't tell you the whole thing. I mean, I'm not going to tell you everything once, right? Then, otherwise, we wouldn't have anything to talk about the rest of the semester. But if you have a, a, a moment, actually, usually called the aerodynamic six. AC is aerodynamic six. But this moment does not depend. On and since it doesn't depend on alpha, it doesn't contribute to the divergence dynamic pressure condition. Okay. And then actually, once we compute the real alpha, not just a divergent condition, I would include that. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the moment is uh, is zero at a long cord for a simple airflow and low speed flow. It is at the quarter cord. So if I if I 
put my lift at the board, then I could ignore that and go on my way. Does that help? Yes, yes, that helps, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, for example, in so it's a half chord. So it goes from the, to the half chord, depending, as the Mach number goes from near zero up to two or whatever. And the transponder program is sometimes very difficult to know exactly where it is. Yet one of the many difficulties of transonic. Okay, other questions? Uh, I have one question. Um, uh, we have the boundary condition uh, for the fixed tree um, where we have alpha and uh, slope of alpha zero at the fixed end. Yes. But yes. for the fixed at both ends, are we assuming uh, pinned uh, supports because we are not having uh, the boundary condition uh, the slope of alpha equal to zero? But if it's uh, clamped uh, at both ends, it should be the slope of alpha should be zero. I didn't quite get that. So uh, he's asking when you say fixed. Oh, only in this case, fixed, fixed, and pin, pin are the same because it's a second order equation, and we're just saying that alpha is zero at both places. Uh, when we look at a, a beam that's bending, which we will do in the next little while, uh, bending of a beam. Uh, from a mathematical point of view, is governed by a fourth order equation, and therefore there are two boundary conditions at each end. And from a physical point of view, there's a distinction for bending between something which is pinned, which means there's no translation of that point, versus something which is clamped, which means not only are the, is there no translation at the end of the beam, but, but there's no rotation at the end. In this case, it's all rotation, it's all alpha, and all we're saying is it's zero rotation, so there are only two boundary conditions. If I grab onto it, there's no real distinction for torsion between fixed, fixed, and pin, and clamp. But for bending of a beam, there is a big difference. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 